Welcome to River's Edge Community Church. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us for our virtual worship service. Today we continue in our series, What We Need Now Is, and today's answer is compassion. Let's face it, compassion is always in short supply. But I fear that after the pandemic is over, the things that we have taught ourselves during the pandemic will stick with us, and compassion will become even more rare. What do I mean? Well, think about the things that we are telling ourselves. Things like, we must focus on ourselves first and keeping us safe. Hunker down and keep what you have because who knows what tomorrow will bring. We need to pay attention to us. Other people will just have to take care of themselves. It seems to me that we are back to instructions before takeoff. In the event of an emergency, put your own mask on first then you can help those around you. The problem is, I fear that we may never get around to helping those other people. And think about how we now look at other people. Strangers are dangerous. They may kill you. Stay separated from other people, even the people you know. Don't trust anyone, period. And for goodness sake, no touching, no handshakes, no hugs, and no no, no, giving of your heart to another person. Now, don't get me wrong. This is good advice for now. So please, wear a mask, stay socially distant, and don't cough on people. My fear is that all those survival skills will become so ingrained in us that they will become habits and will stick with us even when they are no longer necessary. And compassion for others will be lost in a world where we only have room for us. Maybe we don't need compassion more than anything else right now. But I fear if we don't think about it now and start acting compassionately now, the day will come when we desperately will need compassion. But we will not know where to find it. So maybe what we do need right now is compassion. We're glad you're here. This we believe from the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, and who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made human and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, and who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen and amen. Father of life, draw me closer. Rise up within me 
Dear Lord, we come before you this morning and ask for your help in surrendering to a place of openness before you and also a place of recognition of all the things that you have done for us. We thank you that in the midst of all the uncertainty going on right now, that you give us confidence of a greater plan. And we thank you that in times of discouragement, You also offer a hope that's greater than all of our feelings. And we thank you that um, for those of us who are even experiencing times of grief, that you have the power to offer us comfort and renewal. I pray that you would just reveal the countless ways that you are drawing near to us each day so that we can discern your presence and extend the abundance of your love to those around us. For you are worthy of all of our time, our adoration, and our obedience. Help us to not lose sight of showing reverence to you in both the simplest of daily tasks as well as in the silent places of our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This is God's word for us today. Our prayer today is adapted from a prayer written long ago, first penned by Lancelot Andrewis, who lived from 1555 to 1626. It was then discovered and updated and restructured and reworked by Michael Perry, who was a British pastor and hymn writer. Perry died in 1996. So let me pray this prayer over you, and then I'll give you some time to pray for the concerns of your family and your friends. Afterwards, I will close our time in prayer with a brief pastoral prayer. Let us pray together. Lord, perfect in us all that is lacking of your gifts, of faith to increase it, of hope to strengthen it, of love to rekindle it. Let your love shine through our deeds. Let your spirit empower our words. Let your wisdom fill our minds and let your compassion direct our hands and let your will capture our hearts so that we may be your ambassadors in your world. And may we always seek the role of the servant and in so doing, follow in Jesus' footsteps. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please pray now and know that God hears you. Lift up your hearts to him, for he cares for you. Lord, with each passing day, the news is difficult and unsettling. Give us your peace. We pray for those who are struggling in this time, emotionally, financially, physically, spiritually. Give them your comfort. Draw near to them. 
We pray for our healthcare workers, protect them. We pray for our scientists and doctors working on a vaccine, give them your wisdom. And we pray for your church, that you would give us your faith, your love, your grace, that we truly may be your ambassadors in the world, that we may still be your light in this very dark and scary place. Give us your peace, give us your hope, and come close to us that we may know that you are with us, that you love us, and that you will never let us go. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. What we need now, more than anything else, is a miracle. What we need now is compassion. But how do we grow in compassion? Ever notice that two people can look at the same object and see two totally different things? Perhaps you've heard this before, but it's worth rehearing. In 2016, New York Times columnist Josh Katz published a book entitled Speaking American, in which he graphically portrays how we, depending on what part of the country we are from, use different words to describe the same thing. Two different people, one item, different regions results in two totally different words. For instance, if I held up a can of unspecified carbonated soft drink, what would you call it? Some people in our nation would call it a can of soda. Others will say it is a can of pop. And still others will call it a can of Coke. That's right, a Coke can be a Pepsi because for them, a Coke is not necessarily a product of the Coca-Cola company. Two people see the same thing, but depending on where they are from, they use completely different words. Or how about this? If you are in a public space, from what do you drink? Is it a water fountain, a drinking fountain, or is it a bubbler? It all depends where you live. 
This one is tough for me. Suppose you are out driving and the road leads you into a circle. What do you call it? Is it a traffic circle? Or do you call it a rotary like I did growing up? Or is it a roundabout? Now, if you are from Montana, you probably don't even know how to answer this question because you've never seen such a thing. Why waste time in a traffic circle when you can just stop at the intersection and let the next car or buffalo go through? Let's up the ante. How do you pronounce this item? Is it a two-syllable word in which the second syllable is pronounced with a soft A sound? So that if I over pronounce it here for effect, the word is crayon. Or is it a two syllable word pronounced on, so that it rhymes with dawn? It is a crayon. Or is it a one syllable word, crayon? I just heard someone pronounce this crown. Now that sounds crazy to me, but some like it. And what about the word spelled P-E-C-A-N? We have fights in our house over the pronunciation of this word. Should it be pronounced pecan, 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 or pecan? If you think you know, come on over to our house and we'll fight about it. One last example. Should we pronounce these three words the same? or differently. Mary, as in the name, Mary, as in Robin Hood's band of men, and Mary, as in, would you marry me? Many people would argue that there is no difference whatsoever in pronunciation. It's Mary, Mary, Mary. Others believe Mary, the name, and Mary, the matrimonial thing, are pronounced the same, but Mary, happy, is totally different. I would tend to agree with that. And some say all three are different. Fine enough. But I don't get those who say Mary the name and Mary the happy are the same, but Mary, as in would you, is completely different. I don't get that at all. Two people look at the same thing and yet they see things totally different. Tomato, tomato, either, either, Switzerland, Sweden. And while that is fun and exciting to see these differences, it also causes a bit of trouble. Two people read their Bibles. One walk away saying there is a huge accent on compassion and how we are to reach out to those who are hurting and needy. And the other will, may agree that compassion is in the Bible, no doubt, but it is hardly a major emphasis. Who is right? Unfortunately, we can't just take a vote and whoever wins gets to decide. We have to go back to the Bible and see what it says. So here's today's question. Is compassion a major theme in the Bible? Micah 6.8 seems to me to be a good place to start. There we read, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, normally, when we read this verse, we hear Micah say that God requires three things of us. We are to act justly, we are to love mercy, and we are to walk humbly with our God. But the truth is that that last clause, to walk humbly, is the object of the other two. In other words, Micah says this is how we walk humbly with God. We act justly and love mercy. And yet, even that's not quite right. Biblical scholars argue that the primary emphasis here is on us acting justly, while loving mercy provides the emotional context out of which our actions are to be done. We are to do justice out of a heart overflowing with mercy and love. Or to put it negatively, doing justice should never flow out of some dry and dusty obligation. Instead, it should always flow out of 
our compassion. Micah says, this is what God requires of us, that we walk humbly with our God by doing justice out of a heart of merciful love and compassion. Now, I know that wreaks havoc with the song, and I'm terribly, terribly sorry about that, but it brings things into perfect focus. Micah says, you may have thought that all God requires of us as humans is bound up in things like sacrifice and offerings, but you would be terribly mistaken. Instead, this is what God requires, that we love God and walk humbly before Him and demonstrate that love by doing justice out of hearts of compassion and mercy. Ask Micah how important he feels compassion is, and he would tell you it is at the very heart of our most basic response to God. We are to love God by showing compassion to others. But Micah's not saying anything new here. If you search for the word compassion in the Old Testament, you would see that it is used 67 times. And almost 75% of those occurrences are used as a description of God's character. In other words, the Old Testament isn't primarily calling us to be compassionate. It is telling us again and again that our God is compassionate. Why is that such a big deal? Don't we all know that God is compassionate? Here's why. It is so important because there was a time when Israel was on the brink of annihilation and God had mercy on them and rescued them. And that act of compassion shaped how Israel understood God's character forever and shaped how they understood their response to this God. See, after the Exodus, the people of Israel found themselves at Mount Sinai. And while Moses was up on the mountain, the people were down below waiting. And when Moses didn't return on their timetable, they got anxious. And so they made a golden calf and claimed it as their God. It was a rebellion of the worst sort. And as a result, God threatens to destroy the whole lot of them and start all over with Moses. But Moses intercedes for the people and begs God not to wipe the people out. Much like Abraham bargained for Sodom and Gomorrah, so now Moses negotiates with God for the lives of the people. Moses says, remember that this nation is your people. And God basically says, I think I'd rather just start all over with you. And back and forth they go, back and forth, until finally God concedes. Not because he thinks the people are so great, but because he loves Moses. And so he says, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. And Moses says, sold, right there, now, swear to it, show me your glory. Now, it's not that Moses wants this great spiritual experience to feel good about things. No, he is asking God to show himself just as he did in the burning bush. He is asking God to make good on this new promise to be with his people, to redeem his people by giving them a sign. And God says, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you which, granted, sounds a little strange, but in the ancient world, it meant a lot. Instead of leading with his wrath, God is going to be good to his people. See, God is going to promise on oath to reconcile with the people and to bless them once again. Now, when we take an oath, we may place our hands on a Bible or say something like, with God as my witness, but, there is nothing greater upon which God could make a vow than his own name. And so he says, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. Don't miss that. The foundation of all of God's promises are based in his character. The foundation of all of God's promises is his character. And so God sets Moses in the cleft of a rock to protect him. And then he reveals his glory to Moses by walking in front of him. 
And as he does so, he describes his character. He tells Moses who he is. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Who was this God that has entered into this covenant, this sacred relationship with the people of Israel? He is the Lord the compassionate and gracious God who responded to the rebellion of his people with forgiveness. How important was this declaration? It was so important that it is quoted at least eight times in the rest of the Old Testament. Just a sample. David says in Psalm 86, But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. The prophet Joel urges the people saying, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Jonah tells God why he didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place, saying, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And Nehemiah prays, you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Why did God's words to Moses in Exodus 34 become one of Israel's most important creeds? Because it captured the essence of God's character perfectly. Our God is compassionate and gracious. But there's another refrain that we found, we find scattered throughout the Old Testament, usually attached to laws as a motive clause. It is this, I am the Lord your God. Ask anyone in the Old Testament, why do you have to keep all these laws? And they would tell you, These commands are a delight because they are rooted in the character of our God, and our calling is to imitate and embody that character. Yes, God says in Leviticus 19, Be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. But it is also true that he would just as easily have said to us, Be compassionate because I, the Lord, your God, am compassionate. Jump over to the Gospels. Here we see Jesus calling us to the same principle. In Luke 6, he says, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So when it comes to compassion, what was Jesus like? Read the Gospels and you will see time and time again words like these from Matthew 9 here. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Or we see words like this from Luke 7, but let me set it in a context. Jesus happens upon a funeral procession. The only son of a widow has died, leaving his mother destitute and alone. And Jesus sees this woman's anguish. And Luke tells us, and here's the words, Jesus's heart went out to her. And immediately Jesus is moved out of a deep sense of compassion to raise the boy from the dead. Just as an aside, in ancient Jewish funeral processions, a woman customarily led the way to remind everyone that Eve, a woman, sinned first and brought death to us all. But Jesus isn't interested in pointing fingers at anyone. I think Jesus would agree with Bonhoeffer's words here instead. We must learn to regard people less in the light of what they do or omit to do, and more in the light of what they suffer. Jesus sees this woman in light of what she is suffering, and he moves into her pain to heal it. But Jesus did not only show compassion to those who were sick and dying. He also showed compassion to people who were broken. 
almost on the heels of this incident where Jesus raises the son of this widow, we find Jesus having a meal with a Pharisee named Simon in Simon's house. But as they are eating, a prostitute carrying a jar of perfume enters into the house, and she immediately goes over to Jesus and falls down at his feet. And she begins to weep over her sin and her brokenness and pain. And as her tears fall down from her face, they fall upon Jesus' feet in such abundance that she literally begins to wash Jesus' feet with them. And when his feet are clean, she dries the tears on his feet with her hair. And then she even anoints his feet with the perfume. Simon, during this whole thing, is aghast. He only sees her as a prostitute, as a piece of scum, as a vile sinner. But Jesus sees her through the eyes of compassion, and he welcomes her and receives her gift of love. Simon only wants to rebuke this woman, but Jesus honors her and her sacrifice, and he turns to her and says, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. In the very next chapter, Jesus is in another town and is speaking to a very large crowd when a man named Jairus interrupts him because Jairus needs a miracle. And so Jesus goes with him. But before he can go too far, a woman with a menstrual disorder interrupts him. And so Jesus stops what he is doing for Jairus and helps her. Now, I'm with Frank Sonnenberg on this one when he advised, Stop letting other people hijack your day. It's good business advice. It's good wisdom in the course of living and a successful and effective day. But Jesus' days were nothing but people hijacking his day. They were nothing but one interruption after another. Think about all the stories that would never have been if Jesus had listened to Sonnenberg. Jairus' daughter would not have been raised from the dead. This unnamed woman who had been ritually unclean for years would never have found healing. The father who brought his son to Jesus to be healed would have had to watch his son die. And we could go on and on because most of the stories in the Gospels are interruptions. Theologian Jared Bias says, it's almost like the Gospels are written as strings of interruptions tied together by, and now Jesus decided to go here. Almost every single time Jesus heals someone, he is on the way to somewhere else. He is rarely on the way to heal someone. Some of the most important moments in Jesus' life are what we would call interruptions. See, we think interruptions are obstacles that keep us from doing what we feel is far more important. But Jesus saw them as opportunities to serve the needs of others and to put their needs ahead of his own. For Jesus, people are always more important than our plans. People are always more important. Jared Bias is right. Most of Jesus' ministry was on the way somewhere else. But that is what compassion requires. Jump over to Paul. You can find many statements in the New Testament that show us how important compassion is to be in the life of a Christ follower. But Colossians 3 is my favorite. There we read, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Note the order here because it's really important. Paul is not saying be compassionate, be kind, and so forth, so that God will choose you, so that you can be holy, so that you can earn God's love. 
not at all. He is saying, since you are chosen by God, since you are already made holy, since you are dearly loved, clothe yourself with these things. But that raises a question. Why? If we're already holy and dearly loved, why can't we just sit back and watch Netflix? I think there are four main reasons, all of which deal with compassion in one way or another. First, it is important that we live out the reality of God's grace in our lives so that the world around us may see Christ in us. Our embodying compassion is an act of compassion for the world because it allows us to be living signposts pointing to Jesus. Second, Paul knows that doubt is a real thing. And when we are tempted to doubt that we have been made holy, when we are tempted to doubt that we are dearly loved children of God, then we need to see something to prove to our own souls that God is really with us. So God produces compassion in us so that we can be free of all doubt. God gives us hearts of compassion as evidence that He has not left us, but is in fact working in us. As we live out compassion, we see the fruit of God's Spirit working in us, and we know that God is with us in truth and in act. Third, by putting on these virtues, we are expressing our gratitude to God's grace. God chooses us, makes us holy, and loves us, and we express our thanksgiving with grateful words and, more importantly perhaps, by embodying compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. I don't know what language they speak in heaven, but when we put on these things, we are speaking thanksgiving and gratefulness. But most importantly, when we put on these characteristics, we are putting on Jesus. Ask yourself, who is Paul describing here in Colossians 3? Who most embodied compassion in his life? Who was known for his kindness? Who was always humble and gentle and patient? Who bore with his disciples and who bears with us? Who forgave us our sin? Who was love incarnate? When we clothe ourselves with compassion, we're not just clothing ourselves with virtue. We are clothing ourselves with Christ. So, I raised the previous question. Is compassion a major theme in the Bible? Answer, absolutely. It is written in our mandate as humans. It describes the character of our God. It is in full display in the life of Jesus, and it is inscribed in our DNA as followers of Jesus. If we want to be faithful to our calling, then we must be compassionate. Rachel Held Evans said it well, God's ways are higher than our ways, not because He is less compassionate than we are, but because He is more compassionate than we can ever imagine. One night, after a River's Edge music practice years and years and years ago now, our son Dan was putting away a few musical instruments in the downstairs storage closet. He was in a hurry and decided not to turn on the light. He put something on a shelf where he knew there was an open space, and then he stepped back, and something <laughs> bashed into the back of his head. Dan reacted instinctively, like most of us would, a little rage a quiet seething, and probably the formation of a few good adjectives. I know I would. And then he looked up and saw that he had backed into the cross that we use on Communion Sundays, that big wooden cross. And suddenly, the whole situation changed. After all, he said, how can you get upset at the cross? I think this whole sermon is like getting hit in the head by the cross. Everything seems fine and dandy. We are in the church and enjoying, God's, enjoying life as God's chosen and dearly loved people. And then suddenly, 
the overwhelming biblical evidence that calls us to live a life of compassion smacks us in the head. And we are not happy about it. Just a few moments ago, we were quite content with our level of compassion. But now we are being called to a whole new level of giving, of caring, and of seeing the needs all around us and responding to them. So now the question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to follow Jesus and give ourselves to serving the poor and the needy and the forgotten people all around us? Or are we going to bury our head in the sand? Are we going to pretend that we are already doing enough? Don't get me wrong, choosing to live a life of compassion is costly. Maybe that is why what we need right now more than anything else is a miracle. But here's the cool part. By embodying a life of compassion, we become a miracle to those in need. Bob Goff said, we've noticed that people who have failed are more generous with their compassion, more extravagant with their love, and less inhibited by, in their expressions of both. I think it's because these people spend less time caring about what their lives look like and more time figuring out what their lives are all about. Here's what I think. When we love God and love others, when our lives overflow with compassion, then we have figured out what our lives are all about. And no matter how we want to pronounce it, our souls will be merry, merry, merry. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, give us hearts of compassion. Give us eyes to see the needs around us. Give us feet willing to obey. Give us strength to do your will. These are hard days, and we have to be careful about ourselves and focus on ourselves. But this can't be the only thing we do. And if we come out of this pandemic more selfish, more self-absorbed, more self-centered than ever before, this would have been the worst disaster ever. So work in us. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, even now softening our hearts, giving us hearts of compassion so that we would truly love our neighbor as ourselves and that we may demonstrate our love for you in our compassion to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. the blessing of God. Say it with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. God bless you all. Amen.